<clears throat> Tom and I have done a number of talks like this over the years, certainly on uh, every May when Rancheros comes around. We dig around in both the Santa Barbara Museum and Santa Inez and the Carriage Museum to come up with, with wagons and carriages and saddles to do a presentation uh, on the ride and to help continue the understanding of why uh, all of these artifacts are so important. They are living artifacts and celebrate a certain time in transportation in, in our region. And this show, which we had in uh, 2017, uh, was a tremendous, tremendously well received. And so tonight, with the help of Mason and his and the Zoom cat that he has with him, um, <laughs> we're going to take you through saddles and personalities uh, that that went on in Fiesta, certainly during the the halcyon years of Fiesta in the 20s and 30s before the Second World War. So let's let's start. And I do want to share one thing with this uh, picture behind me is that it's kind of important in that we have all four of those saddles in our collection. The original picture was taken in 1931 in Persian Park at a horse show that Silsby Spalding was at. All these saddles belong to Silsby Spalding who was at the Tecolote Ranch in 1928. And we're so fortunate to have the Palacero family be so generous in donating all these artifacts to the museum. A good part of the collection at the museum, we could go on for a couple hours about that, but <laughs> on my left is Sylvie Spaulding's Visalia, uh, called the Visalia Supreme, and it's in our collection today, and it's just absolutely beautiful. All of these saddles that Visalia built, um, they would job out the silver to contract makers, uh, either Robert Shazline or uh, Keiston Brothers, and uh, it was truly, these were truly collaborative efforts where the, the makers and the, the owner, uh, the order person, would uh, work with them to come up with these truly individual patterns. It really was a, a really glorious time for artisanal makers uh, during this period. Here's three pretty snappy looking guys. We, we know uh, all of them are, uh, we figure this is probably a ranchero's Mr. Dory's picture when uh, the gentleman on the first day of the ride would ride to the Santa Barbara Mission. Uh, Tom, you seem to, you recognize the background a little bit. Yeah, this is, like, this is probably down in Schofield Park, you know, where they camped and got ready to go on the ride to the mission. Um, and of course, Dwight Murphy over there on the right, I think you mentioned that earlier. And you can tell, because they've got their satin shirts on, which would not be something they'd ride through the brush on. But, um, they really are turned out very well. We don't recognize Dwight Murphy's saddle because usually he would have a martingale, which is the, the breast wrap that the other two horses have. But um, that's, that saddle pad on the far left, which a Corona pad, which was very, very popular because it really did stand out. I mean, it was kind of flashing lights as you rode down the street, but these guys look pretty good. And the thing that's so interesting is they've got their gabardine pants on, which would be a tad bit warmish today. <laughs> yeah. But uh, gabardine was a pretty popular riding pant at that time. But what a great picture. And seeing the, uh, the bridles with nose bands and the nose chains with conchos on them. Yeah, uh, he's, got a, he's got his bow and shafts on there, too, to match yeah. his bow and saddle, you know. I mean, we, these fellows are turned out very, very nicely. You go to the next slide. This is a great picture of the, the saddle show that we did at the Historical Museum there and that nudie suit that's there in the middle was featured and uh, Trina Mitchum's doing a, a big deal on, uh, uh, on nudie himself. And we have probably, I think three or four nudie suits in our collection. Um, the saddles that you see there in the front there are, are uh, uh, Clark Gables, uh, Leo Carrillo's, uh, Sam Stanwood and, and uh, Tom Stork. Um, Ed Gilmore made the uh, made the, the Clark Gable saddle there, and you can see a picture of Clark Gable in the background. On the far left. Yes. Yeah, the saddle on the far left, which has and those are those are uh, uh, pesos, Mexican pesos, Tom. Yeah, those are Mexican pesos all around it, and there's a bridle that uh, bridle and headstone with it too. So, 
Now I have to tell our audience that uh, the nudie suit in the center, I have actually seen Tom wear this uh, and he uh, is striking in it. Yeah, it's actually the one that I wore is a little different than that. It belonged to David Weber, who owned the Pepper Tree and then Encina Lodge and some hotels around town. Uh, we actually used to go fox hunting with him, but Pam Weber donated the museum. And I actually wore it a couple of times. I wore it one time during the, uh, uh, during the Fiesta Parade when they interviewed us at the Carriage Museum, and I put it on and walked in there. To, and uh, there's a YouTube video on that. that was kind of fun. <laughs> but I did wear the jacket to a, a pres President's Parade when I was honorary president. Uh, last year of El Presidente of, of Fiesta. In the background, uh, yeah, the picture of uh, Ricard there and some, we'll get to those, yep. That's a, that's a great story, Tom. Uh, I wish I could have seen that uh, when it happened. Uh, and we've, we've actually got our first question here. Um, someone asked on the first slide, was that Ronald Reagan in the middle on that picture? No, no. Uh, in fact, we have, we know who that is, don't we? I think we have that on our note somewhere. No. Uh, I don't know who that is. I don't. It looks oh, that's, uh, wait, oh. Mosier like Fortante. That's Mosier. There's Spencer Weed on the left, Mosier in the center, and Dwight on the right. I don't know who Mosier was. Do you know, Tom, who, who that was? No, I don't. I'm not familiar with him at all. He's got a pretty darn slick satin shirt, though, I will tell you that. Yeah, he does. With arrow pockets, please. He is, so he's kind of rocking that look there. This is a good, kind of a good centerpiece shot of the saddle show. Uh, we were really pleased with how it looked. Uh, it gave everybody an opportunity to get really up close and personal on these saddles. Uh, Tom could go on and on about Visalia, probably till sometime after Thanksgiving, but... Uh, <laughs> Don't talk for a the, the saddle that's featured in here was from 1946, and it was an old Spanish days trophy saddle um, that was found up in Elko, Nevada by Griff Durham. He found it, he saw it up there, and it has the old Spanish days logo on the fender there. And then on the back it says, uh, Old Spanish days, 1946 on the back. And gosh, you know, he called me up and he says, you need the saddle, you know, and told me about it and we got it bought. And actually we got some funds from, you know, one of our members that donated the money to buy the saddle for us. So that was great. And then over on the left, we got Dick May, who was a Santa Barbara guy that a lot of horse people know today. Uh, maybe not know today, but uh, that was a 1954 Dick May saddle and also a Fiesta saddle that, J.J. Hollister won and donated to the museum. And then over on the right, William Rafour, that, that was made in 1903 and has all the, uh, and they, they pounded, they used Mexican silver to pound these conchos out. Uh, conchos out. Um, there was more silver content in those than in the, the, the American were, silver dollar, right? They were softer. They were easy, much more easier to form yeah. than sterling. And, uh, but these, uh, again, these, uh, this Visalia saddle, that we're looking at in the center is a pretty classic. I mean, you could, a horse could wear that, could fit that today, even though quarter horses and horse, horses have kind of changed conformation a little bit. It's a, I think we get to a, we get to a, a Sherman Luma saddle coming up and, and there is, they're astoundingly appropriate for horses today. He was uh, uh, an incredible maker, but this is, this was a great find and, and Griff, Durham, who is probably the, uh, the, the greatest authority on the Visalia Stock Saddle Company living today, was instrumental in helping us with this show. Yeah, they, they made uh, the, the saddles for the uh, um, Fiesta Stock Horse Show and Rodeo up until 1948. And then 1949, Jedlica started making them. And then in 1954, Dick May made them for a few years. And um, But yeah, it was... Uh, We've seen a couple of these saddles that we have one in the collection that's uh, from 1931 that they really used. I mean, it got beat, but they had a good time riding that there. Go to the next slide, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is a beautiful saddle that belongs to the Historical Museum. It was made in 1926 by Visalia also. And, um, it's one of three in sequential numbers. This is 18,980. 
and you'll see 19, uh, uh, 978 along the way, but that's beautiful silver work. Bill knows a lot about the Chazeline who made all this silver. This, this um, silver rope that you see going around the perimeter of the saddle, outlining it, uh, is, is a process, was made by a process uh, by a piece of machinery called a drop hammer, which is effectively a rock on a rope that you pull up and let go and it comes down and it, it hits into a, a die, a, a, a two-piece die, a forming die and a pressing die. And the way this rope was done was by, if you look on the picture on the right, if you look at just four of those little strands, that's what the die was. So they would continually make these and then butt them together and affix them to the leather. So around the tapaderos, around the entire work of the saddle, except for the gullet and uh, the cantle. And those were different dies that were a little, uh, the, the rope dies on the saddle itself were flat. The one on the cantle and the gullet were arced, sort of a half, half circle. And then they'd be crimped on there. And this was classically considered a three to one process where they'd do it three times and one of them would work. So it was very time consuming, but at the time, labor was much less expensive and so was silver. But it's an absolutely glorious example of the silversmith work. This saddle, if you, if you can't see it in that last picture there on the side, but yeah, into the jockey seat right there, there's three horse heads there and that's a, the three pharaoh horses. They were Arabian horses and it's a famous picture that was painted by, I can't remember who that was. Um, but oh, I know. Yeah, there. there's a billion prints of it. Yeah, yeah. It's, and then you can see that bucking horse in the, you know, on the oh. fender there. So all those saddles were well, one of a kind, pretty elaborate. This is a classic Visalia bucking horse. A version of it appears on the C plate uh, that they used to identify saddles, and these are the swell caps. Uh, if you go back, Mason, to that one, uh, these are the swell caps on the pommel and they're filled with horsehair uh, on top of the on top of the tree to give it a little cushion and those silver conchos have the uh, little little berry pins you can see there and they had individual what are called escutcheon pins on the back and they'd be hammered into the tree and through the hair to hold it in place a lot of handwork that's the uh, C plate. And uh, if Griff Durham were here with us and we asked him, you know, give us the date of that saddle, he'd know because he's researched all of this. But mid 20s, I guess. And uh, yeah, because uh, the, the book that Visalia had, where all these saddle makers write down the number of the saddle and who bought it, uh, the Visalia Saddle Company burned down in, I think, 1931. And the book was lost. There was some stories about it got swept up and thrown into the dumpster, but who knows about that. But yeah. so there is no uh, no book that tells who these saddles were made for. We know this is Dwight Murphy's for sure, but it has his name on it. So. <laughs> and there is a there's a die where you can get, and I think, uh, well, I know for a fact that uh, uh, the third generation Chazeline, Rod Chazeline, uh, is make can make this and the bucking horse is in the die itself but if you wanted a gold bucking horse they would strike the plate once and then strike the area where the bucking horse was cut that out with a with a jeweler saw and then overlay it on top of the sterling horse that's underneath and it would give it a little little more extra special look but it just shows you how uh, how labor intensive it was, but if that's what the customer wanted, they got it. This is amazing. Tom, tell, tell them about this one. Yeah, well, this is more of silver work done by Shazline, and, and this is something extraordinary because I've never seen anything like this before. Yeah, this, uh, these, these very uh, whimsical cowgirls sitting on a, on a quarter moon. I mean, this thing is a song waiting to happen, but yeah. they're these wonderful, whimsical cowgirls with these really great stylized hats, the cactus, it's in the, the, the uh, 
mesas in the background, the moon rising. I don't know. This is as, this is as good as it gets. And to think you're going to put this on the back of a saddle is pretty amazing. But it's just as it's just a wonderful, wonderful example. And when you get a chance to go down to the carriage museum, take a look at it because it's really incredible. Yeah, that's amazing. You look at the quality of these saddles and the condition that they're in. This is almost a hundred years old. This yeah. is ninety-four years old. Hope we look that good. Yeah. <laughs> There's another saddle uh, of Dwight Murphy's uh, called the Moon Saddle. You can see by that on that photo on the left, there's a little moon down in there, and they they've used turquoise on this saddle. I guess it's one that I've never seen before that they've that they've done. But this is one of the ones in sequential numbers. This is eighteen thousand nine seventy nine, and then the eighteen thousand nine seventy eight is in the carriage museum also, and we don't have a picture of that. But it's really unusual to see stones put into these conchos, it really gives you a sense that these saddles were really only used for special occasions, for a parade where you're going to have the horse turned out, you're going to step on, and you're going to go straight on flat ground for a couple of miles, and then you're going to get off. Because it's just, they really weren't, even with the bezels surrounding the turquoise, it just is, it's not something you'd see on a trail ride somewhere. And Dwight Murphy had a lot of saddles and a lot of horses. And if you're a good friend of Dwight Murphy, if you rode in the Fiesta Parade, you were, you were horseback and you had some nice equipment. You are well turned out for sure. Well, that's the thing about the Fiesta Parade. Everybody, there were a lot of capable people who supported it. They, and capable meaning that they were, could afford to have these really wonderfully nice saddles made. Uh, and back then in those days where, as we said earlier, labor was relatively inexpensive. Uh, something like this would have probably been a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, obviously can't do that today, but uh, the important moment was, you know, why show up if you don't look good? And I think that's what a lot of people <laughs> did when they got into the parade. This is a bowling saddle uh, made for Leo Carrillo. Uh, it was in the Spalding collection as the LC engraved in the horn cap there. And um, Bowling and Hollywood made a lot of, uh, he made a lot of working saddles in addition to a lot of his silver saddles that he had. He made, he made just over 10,000 saddles in his lifetime and only 10% of them were silver and had silver on them. So this was really, a, this is really a great example of a using saddle that Bowling would have made and the fact that this is in the 40s, you can start to see the influence, uh, the way the, 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 the swells and the palm on the front, the, that, that angled horn, Cliff Wade, and, uh, who, who designed the Wade saddle in the early 40s, started having great influence on the weight of saddles, the amount of leather that was there, how close you were in contact with the horse. Because it really, they were trying to get closer to what an English saddle felt like. And, uh, you know, Leo Carrillo could ride anything with hair on it. So it was, it, that didn't matter. But the fact remains is he had a saddle that was very, very forward thinking uh, in its design. And Bolin was, uh, he really had control of the trees that he did very well and did some amazing things right, right till about 1950. And then, uh, yeah, you kind of see in the front there where that yeah. is more 50s looking, where it's leaning towards more of that, and then they went yeah. the Cheyenne roll and the cantle down the yeah. back there. You can that's that's because those cantles would drop and you get a real low Cheyenne roll, Cheyenne yeah. roll in the 50s. Yeah, it's a great saddle. Yeah, this is another saddle that was given to, that, to the carriage museum by Silsby Spalding, and it was gifted to him by Will Rogers. Uh, Silsby Spalding was the first mayor of Beverly Hills. He owned the Tecolote Ranch in 1928 in Winchester Canyon, and his family kept the ranch until 1959. But they, um, uh, Will Rogers gave Silsby Spalding the saddle after he made him honorary mayor, I believe it was right around that time. And uh, this, this is very fancy Charles saddle. The stitching that you see, I don't know if we can get close on it, but it's the, the, all on the saddlebags, 
uh, on the rigging for the stirrups. This is all individual. It's, it's a process in Mexico called piteada, which is a method of using yucca strands as well as a literally silver thread. And it was so strong you could build up a surface, like you could see that rose in the center of the saddlebags. And it really is just an elegant, elegant thing. And frankly, really tough too. You know, you think that where your legs hang down to go into those stirrups, on those stirrup leathers, you rub it all off. But, you know, 1924, this saddle has obviously been ridden, but it's in incredible shape. There's a few pictures around that I've seen that it was rode in the Fiesta Parade. Again, Sylvie Spalding was kind of like Dwight Murphy. He had a lot of horses, he had a lot of saddles, he had a lot of buddies, you know, they lived pretty large back in those days. You know, he had that nice big ranch in Winchester Canyon and, and he participated in the Fiesta Parade quite a bit with some of the videos that I have uh, of the home videos that they shot in 16 millimeter that were transferred over to uh, CDs has quite a few pictures of him in the Fiesta Parade with his buddies and and you can sure recognize some of the saddles that were in his collection. Um, so we have a, a another question. Someone was wondering if you could please identify parts of the saddle for us novices watching. Uh, would this be a good picture to be able to kind of maybe pick apart a, the different? Yeah, I, I think we need. A, we can go to a regular. Yeah, we'll get to another saddle and do that. Yeah, maybe. we'll get to that. Yeah, happy to. But here, here you can see a better shot of the stitching of each of those little embroidered leaves. And a lot of people have, have asked, you know, why is there always flowers and leaves on a saddle? And it, it, saddle makers are, are drawn to the fact that everything that goes into making a saddle is in some way a natural product. There's wood, there's rawhide, uh, there's leather. And so the celebration of the natural world always had a, a, a certain attraction I mean, going back to the Moorish makers, where you saw uh, na natural things that were generic to the area that the saddle was made. So here in Santa Barbara County, you'll see oak and acorn leaf stamping. Uh, in Texas, you'll see prairie rose. So it's really it really helps to identify, in, in many ways, the region the saddle was made. This is a Jedlica saddle that, that uh, you know, and Jedlica saddles aren't great collection items today, but this one, this particular one is. This was made in 1951 for a, a Santa Barbara lady named Edna Brooks. And a great story about this saddle is that, um, you know, there was a saddle that came up for auction. That was, uh, it was stock number 568. And it was, looked like a brand new saddle. Um, and we were trying to buy the saddle and up for selling for, it was unbelievable at $14,000. About maybe a month after that, this fellow named Pat Bennett, that's a friend of the museums um, that lives in San Inez, called us up, called me up one day and he said, you know, I got this Jedlica saddle I don't use anymore. He said, do you want it? And it was this saddle here and he gave it to us. <laughs> and this is stock number uh, 548 and he had 568 and this was made in 1951. And this is just, it, it's in great condition. It's just what we wanted, you know, it's something that we needed because, you know, Jet Like a Saddle today isn't that collectible like a, like a Loomis or, you know, a, a Forbes saddle, but someday it will be, you know, when I'm not running the museum anymore. My son, <laughs> when's, that, when's that gonna be? Excuse me? When's that gonna be? That yeah. won't happen. You're, you're, we're keeping you there forever. Yeah, I'll stay there for a long, I won't leave for a long time. <laughs> But anyway, it was a nice addition to the museum and, and to have something like this. And you can see, again, this is made in 1951. So we still got the high camel in the back and they haven't quite gone to that Cheyenne roll. When you get to the 1954 saddle, the Dick May saddle you'll see here later on, uh, you'll see that change. So you, well, here, we can, do, we can do the parts here, I think. Yeah, this is beautiful. So this is a really elegant Visalia. Uh, and probably one of the great examples of Chazeline silver work, this sunburst pattern. And this was built for Jack Mitchell, who was the founder of Rancheros Vistadores. And uh, nothing subtle about this little baby, but um, 
you you can see that he had a he had shafts that were made that had the sunburst on it. You can see it in the carving on the leather on the drop of the tapaderos, and that we'll just go through those parts. Those the place where you put your feet, the stirrup is covered by what this is called an eagle beak, eagle beak tapadero. And uh, it's because it's got that kind of a beak shaped form in the front. And uh, they have these long flappy things that hang down. And in many cases, uh, they were used instead of spurs to uh, urge a horse to move to whatever direction you kind of whack them in on the shoulder. Uh, the skirts that you see on the on the top where the the uh, silver forms are for the sunburst, uh, the the cantle in the back, which you can see on the picture on the left, and as Thomas said, there's there's straight up cantles like this, and then there's one that's called a Cheyenne roll that has a little shelf that goes to the back. The front of the saddle. Uh, where the horn is, I think we all know what the horn is, uh, and that the, the silver area below it is a, a pommel, or and that helps kind of hold you in. Uh, but it's a there's there's square skirts, there's round skirts. Uh, it really depends on the design you want. But this is a all saddles have those basic parts in them, and the intent is to make it as comfortable for you to ride and as comfortable for the horse to carry you. Yeah, and this saddle again, you know, it belonged to Jack Mitchell and he, he was a founder of Ranchero as Bill said, but he also owned uh, American Airlines. And, and again, I gotta tell you, this picture is pretty fantastic too. Uh, Bill Reynolds curated a show at the American Quarter Horse Hall of Fame years ago and had these pictures taken and he took some pictures of some saddles that we have at the museum too. And they're, they're just kind of nice to have and he did a fantastic job with that show too. So we have a, a couple other questions are rolling in. Um, one person asks, what is the difference between rawhide and leather? Well, leather would be simply the hide of the cow. Uh, rawhide is a uh, drying process. Help me here, Tom. Uh, I'm trying to put it as simply as possible, but um, Rawhide was principally used not so much to cover things as it was to build delicate things. In other words, the trees of all of these saddles would be, uh, the, the, the hair of the hide would be shaved off and the uh, hide would be stretched out in the sun and dried. And either it would be cut into strings real narrow strings that could be braided into making ropes or as the Spanish call them, riatas, which were, had, had a tremendous amount of life and were used in uh, very precise roping for the vaqueros. And it became almost a challenge to see how thin you could make your strings to, to uh, braid them together. And then the larger hides were used to cover the wooden trees to give them a, a certain uh, a collection and would help hold it all together uh, before the, the thicker pieces of leather were added to the saddle to make the form. I, I, that's as simple as I can say it. I was wondering, you know, on the, uh, where they took the, the, after the hide was dried and ready to go and they were going to make riatas or ropes out of them, how they got 60 foot ropes out of them, they'd, they'd start in the center and then they'd just start cutting a circle and a circle and they'd just keep going and going and going until they got a long piece of uh, rawhide to be able to braid it to make a rope. Well, you know, one thing that we have to really be amazed about is Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara County is really the, the center, uh, certainly after the center of the Vaquero culture with, the, with the, the mission culture that came through California. And when the missions were secularized, this is another lecture for another time, but I'll give you the, 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 the cocktail napkin version. When the, the mission lands were broken up and 
favorites of the Mexican government were given land grants, of which we have many in Santa Barbara County. Uh, the, the workers and the vaqueros that worked on those ranchos were blessed with three incredible things. They had horses, they had great, they had time, there was cattle. And so they worked very, very diligently to make themselves the best horsemen they could. And what that involved was making their own gear, training their own horses, and doing as much as they could to be as consequential to themselves as capable humans. And it really is something to see what the vaquero culture had, did during that era. And it really lasted from the 30s up till uh, the, the drought and the floods of the mid 1860s when uh, those ranchos were all broken up. But at Tom's Museum, you can see the effects of all of that as well as at the Santa Barbara Historical Museum. And you can see how unique and delicate this culture was, but it held on. And it really is something we all have as part of our heritage living in Santa Barbara County. All right, great. Um, I've, we've got two more questions before we, we move on. Um, one is about our previous slide. Um, someone asked, what is that thing on the back that looks like it would hold an instrument? For a, a fencing tool. Um, you know, the cowboys would ride around fixed fences. They'd, they'd ride the circle. They'd start at one place and ride around the whole ranch and then start riding around again. It took two or three days to do it. They'd do it. But inside of there was a fencing tool, which is a pair of pliers and a hammer and a, something to pull the nails out with. And... It's a great, great it's, it's something you can buy today. And it would be, it's, everyone should have one in their truck or their Prius. Yeah, you can bust your window out with it. Yeah, you can bust your window out if you get stuck. <laughs> you just go into any, you know, any hardware store or any Home Depot and say, I need a fence tool, and they'll show you what it is. Yeah, farm supply, tractor supply, yep. they're all available today. The original uh, Cowboy Swiss Army knife. It is. It's, you know, you can whack somebody on the head with it, too, if you have to. <laughs> well, someone else has another uh since we're on the Jedlica saddle, someone says um, they have a Jedlica, Jedlica saddle as well, and they were wondering, is it more the maker or the age and condition that determines collectible status? Mm. Well, I think it depends. Uh, certainly Jedlica's within 100 miles of Santa Barbara is very, very well known. Uh, but Tom, you've seen an awful lot of Jedlica saddles over the Oh, definitely. You bet. And that's quite a few of them. You know, we have, uh, we have Carol Stork's Jedlica saddle. We have this particular one here, but this one was a little more important to the collection because of the age and the condition that it's in. Uh, Juan Laura made saddles, you know, and up till 87 for Jedlicas. And um, so there's quite a few of those out, but collectible today, probably not real collectible today, but maybe in the future. And one last question while we're on this slide. Um, someone asked, uh, they said that they thought this saddle was made for a lady. Is, is that correct or is it made for, for a man? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I, is it, I wonder why they feel it would be made. Is it because it looks short? Maybe they yeah, can, maybe they can answer that. Why, why, whoever asked the question, why do you think it looks like it's made for a lady? Because it really is uh, pretty classic of that era. Um, and the difference is it just isn't as chunky. Uh, that was part of the thing that was going on in the 50s. Uh, the influence of the sa of saddle makers who were making a little lighter saddle. And uh, remember in the in the 50s and up into the 60s was sort of the era of the bulldog quarter horse, which was a real chunky round looking horse. And you really didn't need a whole, didn't need a whole lot of leather to hold on to. So it was uh, uh, you 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 can see this stylistic thing happening, and it really is, frankly, it's really quite a contemporary looking saddle. Yeah, you go and look at the saddles in the in the carriage museum that are all lined up there, and you look at the the width of the tree, and you look at the quarter horse trees of the '50s, how much wider they are, and you look at uh, Dwight Murphy saddles, you know, from 1926 and some of the 19 or the 1880s saddles that are real narrow and those horses were, you know, more thoroughbred looking than the quarter horses that we see today, you know, that are in the 50s. 
Yeah, they were little bulldog type horses. So you can see the evolution of that and all the saddles we have at the museum. I don't think, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't say this was, this is uh, not, it's either man or woman. This, there really isn't any, you know, specification here. So we received a follow-up from the, the person who asked it. Oh, good. Uh, they, they thought they'd heard it was for a lady. Uh, sorry, they didn't share the, the information, but um, that's cool that it uh, opened up the conversation about the evolution of the saddle. Yeah, yeah I thought made for a woman, Edna Brooks, you know, but what good old guy could ride it easily. Yeah, I mean, just because, you know, you can see on a lot of these saddles, the jockeys and the, uh, the stirrup leathers are a little longer on some of them. He didn't show us. This, this is great. This saddle here is another one that belongs to the historical museum that we have on loan. And it was, uh, you know, in the basement. And um, I was down there looking around. And um, thanks to Bill Reynolds and some of the other members of the, the museum there that, you know, let us kind of look around before we weren't able to see what was at the museum. I don't go in big detail about that, but anyway, <laughs> SJS on the back, when I saw that saddle and I looked at his Visalia and I looked at the condition, I mean, this thing is beautiful. It was made in about 1934, the nearest I can figure with that number talking to Griff. Um, that, um, and I'm going, SJS, I wonder, you know, and there was, there was a tag on it and everything, but it didn't say who owned it. And so I went back to the office and there's a, Walker Tompkins wrote that book, uh, Santa Barbara History Maker. So I'm going down the list going SJS. I got down to Samuel J. Stanwood and I'm going, yeah, this is it, you know. Oh, yeah. It's got to be it. It's got to fit. The, the sheepskin on it looks pretty brand new. I can't see any detail. I mean, if the sheepskin wore out, the saddle would be more worn. So, yeah. you know, I'm kind of thinking, but he, he drove stagecoaches and drove wagons too. So anyway, but this, yeah, is really, this is really a great example, though, of the saddle maker's ability to stamp leather. Uh, this is these kind of the flowers that you see there. We talked a little bit about why they use flowers. But this is a stamping process, and we don't know who did the stamping because uh, this is of an era where the shop that made the piece was more important than the individual maker. It would be like buying a fine piece of jewelry from Tiffany's in the 20s. When you bought something from the 20s and 30s from Visalia, you knew you had incredible craftspeople who were working on it. And that atelier system, as it is called, where the studio or the shop was king, as opposed to the individual maker. The difference of the era was Edward H. Bolin, uh, who made sure everybody knew who made it, that he made everything. Uh, but that's who Bolin was. But this is just such a incredible, and the fact it's the age it is, it says Sam probably didn't write it that much. You know, yeah. that carving wasn't worn down. Yeah, it's it's one beautiful piece. So we just got a question asking, because it is in such a nice uh, condition, how do people keep their saddles in good repair? Well, Tom, Tom yeah, we, this, you know, it doesn't need much repair, and we're very careful about, you know, you don't want to go in and, and take a saddle and start tearing it apart and putting it back together again and putting new pieces in there. That just destroys you know, the value of a saddle. Um, but this, you know, I mean, we clean them, we keep them pretty clean. We use Murphy's oil soap to get all the dirt out of the, the carving in there. You can't imagine how much as you can see in the back of this candle, how clean that is. And then we use some, uh, you know, some skid mores to make it look nice and it treats the leather. I mean, this thing is fantastic. It's beautiful. And it's got those famous Visalia conchos that Bill was talking about earlier on some of those uh, 1946 saddle too. So they always kind of kept uh, about the same conchos on those saddles. Yeah. But, but they, but getting back again, you know, the, you know, tearing apart a saddle and replacing the sheepskin because it's all dirty, you know, I mean, I talked to a lady in, in, in New York and she had a, an old, old Spanish day saddle. I asked her, I said, well, how'd you, How'd you get a, you're in New York, how'd you get an old Spanish Dave saddle from Santa Barbara? She said, oh, my husband's a saddle maker. This guy brought it in and he needed new saddle strings on it and he put a new sheepskin on it. And he had to repair the fender and I'm going, <laughs> the conversation went downhill from there. But you, know. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't want to mess with these things and start repairing them because it just, it, it just destroys the value of them and, and the collectability of it. 
this is another beautiful saddle that, that was given to us by the uh, Palacero family that belonged to Selsby Spalding. But we have 11 saddles in the collection that have that owl on it. And that owl there has a ruby eyes in it, another Shazline uh, feature that, and Rob Shazline, the grandson of the, the Shazline that started this whole thing, ran across that die one time when he was looking through his stuff and he'd asked Griff Durham, he said, what's this owl all about? You know, because we got horse, we got saddles in the collection that have an owl and the, the concho that's on the stirrup down there at the bottom. But this was Silsby Spaulding's. This is one of the saddles that's in the picture behind me um, on the, over my shoulder, my right shoulder. Or my left shoulder, I guess. I don't know what you want. To <laughs> but anyway, so this is another, you know, you can see a square skirted and the, the carving on it's just beautiful and it's in fantastic condition, made in about 1926, 27. Um, but it's it's beautiful. And and I think this is a saddle, yeah, you took this to the Quarter Horse Hall of Fame uh, yeah. show that you did there because that's where the speakers came from. But look at that picture, isn't that awesome? And that, that the girth of the cinch that you see hanging down is all those little strands are not mohair, they're horsehair, which at the time had was really the, a, a technical amazing thing because the, the tensile strength of that horsehair was incredible. And it is as gloriously beautiful today as it was when it was made. So you get yeah. a chance to get down there and see this saddle, take a look at it. And that's the thing that they're all complete. I mean, all the saddle strings are on there, they're original. Uh, the sheepskin's original underneath, the, the girth's original, the latigo's original, the off is original. I mean, it's, uh, you could ride the saddle today. I'd sure check the off and the latigo, but I mean, that could, <laughs> you could ride, you did have fun riding that. That'd be comfortable saddle riding the parade for sure. Some of those silver saddles that they make, the Tom Flowers ones and some of the other ones aren't real comfortable to ride. Yeah, but you can do it for about a, a mile. Yeah. You know, and then you have to have rehab when you get off, but you know. I, I loaned one to a guy with a, a husband of a El Presidente, and uh, he said that was a pretty rough ride. But. <laughs> ah. Oh, this is great Loomis, huh, Bill? Yeah, this, you know, the thing about Sherman Loomis, who was a maker in, in Santa Barbara, I've yeah, only they're... seen six of them in my life. And there's one, this one I've seen, there are some in private collections here in San Inez, and there's one over at the San Inez Valley Historical Museum. But the thing about it is they were designed in such a way that you could put this saddle on a horse today, one of today's horses, and it would fit. And they, he just had a way, the, the arc of the seat, and this is what's called in-seat rigging, where you can see the, the leather that holds the stirrup on, you can see it appear in the seat where you're where you'd sit down the arc of that seat is called the ground seat and sherman loomis could put one of the greatest ground seats in the saddle historically of anybody and he just uh did some amazing things as did his son after after he passed yeah these uh he had that shop on state street and uh princess louise came into a shop she was from england uh a sister to the queen, I suppose, I think it was. Uh, but she came into a shop and she had a little handbag. She says, can you make one of these handbags look like that? And that's kind of started that whole thing where he became a pretty famous leather maker in addition to making saddles. And these saddles today, we have, um, I think, five in the collection today. Um, and four of them came out of the Spalding collection. This came through the Mosier Foundation because they ended up with some of Spalding's collection. So a big long story there, but anyway, um, yeah, this is fantastic. This is beautiful. So we have a few more questions rolling in. Um, a couple of people were wondering, was Sam Stanwood's saddle, as well as just most of these saddles uh, you guys have been talking about, um, are they not generally for riding anymore? Or are they just for special occasions like Fiesta? They, they could be rode, sure. They could be rode, but you know, yeah. they're, they're collector's items, so we like to, you know, keep them, you know, the way they are. They're, they're certainly, you could throw that on a horse and ride it today. That one and the, the Spalding saddle, you just saw, the, you could ride this one today. This one probably wouldn't want to. <laughs> both museums, both of the museums, both Santa Barbara Historical Museum and the Carriage Museum, 
have attempted to maintain these saddles in using condition, meaning they'd hold together. Uh, Tom is certainly uh, in, in the city of Santa Barbara and in the county, probably one of the premier experts on how to maintain these things properly. And uh, a saddle is no good if you can't put it on the back of a horse and ride off. But in many cases, a lot of these saddles have had, before they came to us, they weren't taken care of. And uh, you really can't replace the parts to denigrate the original design. But certainly most of the ones in the collection at the, at the Carriage Museum, I mean, if push comes to shove, you could put it on a horse. Don't you know yeah, they're, they're, they're maintained all the time. We have Alex at the museum. He's a full-time employee there. Been there almost 10 years and he helps me take care of these and keeps everything clean because you can walk down that, that roll of saddles. They're all sideways now instead of looking straight at them. They're all sit up on a little bench and you can see the sides, you can see the carving, you can see all the silver work on all these saddles and they're very, very nice. But so, so Tom, that's a good segue into another question we have, uh, which is, would you consider hosting a saddle cleaning class uh, to show people how these amazing, amazing items are so well taken care of. I'm, I'm sorry, we would show somebody how to clean their saddles? Yeah, uh, would your museum be interested in like hosting a, uh, like a talk where you show how saddles are cleaned and maintained? Oh, I'm sure. I think some point in time we would do something like that if somebody was interested in that kind of thing and got a group together. We've done different little deals like that, probably not for a little while now until we get the this thing cleared up with it. We're not, the museum's not open right now, but sure, it, you have them get in touch with me and we'd be happy to do that. It would be really <laughs> helpful. It would be helpful too, because unfortunately there's so many items on the market today that do more harm than good to a saddle. Uh, it's, it's pretty basic how to clean them, but I think if you had, if Tom showed, walked you through the process it would be really, really helpful for a lot of people who are not putting things on the saddle that smother it. I mean, you know, you have to look at a saddle as kind of a living thing. It's leather. It was on an, it was on an animal and there's pores in it. It's skin. So you don't want to put something on it that's going to close those pores up and, and make it dead. Yeah, so, there's, yeah, I was going to say there's people out there that, I mean, People put needs foot oil on your baseball glove, you know, and that's where it belongs. Um, <laughs> you sure, certainly don't want to put on a saddle and, you know, stuff, things like that. You put on a saddle where you see a problem and then it's going to make the leather go the other way. I remember Griff Durham, Durham telling me that one time is, you know, you've got a real problem with some of the stuff that you put on some of these saddles that if you're not very careful, the leather will go the other way and you'll be worse shaped than you were before you started. So. So one, one final question, and then I think I'm going to save some more of these till the end so we can keep moving through the presentation. But um, do, do either of you know the date of this Loomis saddle? This Loomis saddle here? Yes. Yeah, uh, probably 1890s, you think? Yeah. 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 Which is kind of a blow mind. It's over 100 years old, and you could still put it on a horse today. Yeah. You know. And again, this is one of several that we have. Yeah, this is great saddle. It belongs to the Historical Museum too. And this is uh, one of two that are, are known today. Uh, Rafor was, you know, he, not a real famous guy, but he was from Santa Barbara. His family was in the restaurant business, but this was made in 1903 and belongs to the, the, the Historical Museum called the, um, I think they call it the Bosky Saddle because that's who it was made for. Uh, but given to the, the Historical Museum by, uh, 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 price Postal and Parma, one of the attorneys in town. For the price, I can't remember exactly. Anyway, oldest law firm in California. Yeah, yep. and this is just—I uh, mean, again, here's another saddle. It's just fantastic. You look at it, and that that silver was found out of Mexican coins, um, but it's in fantastic condition today. The other saddle. We tried to get a picture, I think, uh, you know, again, Griff uh, well traveled and gets around the Bradford Britain has one. Uh, and he wanted to take a picture of it, but they said they were closed and they wouldn't let him in, you know. Sure, so, that's in Sheridan, Wyoming, yeah. Yeah, but that yeah, is fantastic. This is, and we're glad to have it on loan from the Historical Museum again. You know, the thing, the thing that's so important to remind everybody 
is that we have a tremendous relationship with the Carriage Museum because it's, it's all about how much room you have. And the Historical Museum is limited, Tom's, the Carriage Museum is limited, but we, tr we really try to have as many of these historic saddles be available for people to see. And Tom is in, that's a focus of the, his museum. And so we we really try to have as many things not stuck down in the in the basement like so many museums do today, but have them out where people can see them, and really truly enjoy the history because it's so important to uh, our region in Santa Barbara County. Yeah, I got to tell you, in the last it's been just the last ten years or or you know that we've had this relationship that we really enjoy today where we've been working together and. Us getting involved with the historical museum on the saddle show has been just the greatest thing we've ever been involved with as far as our saddles and things and and to get the word out and people you know see this show and they really enjoy it we'd like to do this live again sometime yeah absolutely because we're hams yeah <laughs> give us something to do anyway <laughs> So, and your uh, your museum also just down, uh, sorry, my cat is trying to make a cameo here. Uh, your museum just donated a carriage as well to us for our outdoor guest exhibit. Uh, so if anyone hasn't checked out our outdoor exhibit yet, uh, you can see um, the carriage on loan from the, the carriage museum. And we also have a saddle uh, on display as well, so. Yes, yeah, we brought that Ricard wagon over and yeah, it's really, really nice. It's. Uh. Don Marco. And there's some, yeah, there's some great pictures of it right there that, again, from the Quarter Horse Hall of Fame when Bill Reynolds took this down to that show down there. But this is another, <laughs> if you see on the left, you can kind of get an idea of the gallery, you know, when we had the show. And that's, that was a real deal, walking around that, you know, taking people there and showing them that the, the show was wonderful. This is uh, made by Edward H. Bolin, probably one of the premier saddles that he made for Jack Mitchell. Uh, his secretary, Elmer All, rode this quite a few years in, at Rancheros. Um, it's called euphemistically the acorn saddle because of the form that you see. Uh, so many acorns around it. Uh, Jack Mitchell's ranch, the Juan y Lolita in the San Andes Mountains were covered with oak trees and he was, he was, he had plenty of acorns. But you see not only the whip stitching of uh, leather on the perimeter of the saddle, you see the, the hammered rope, which we talked about earlier. Uh, you see filigree work in the silver where areas are cut out, and certainly on the cantle and the pommel and the swells in the front. That rope horn would take about 12 hours to explain how the hell he did that how Boland did that. But literally, that is entirely hand formed. It would not be something you would want to rope with, uh, but it would be certainly something from a parade perspective, this would stand out. And it truly is uh, one of the really great moments of the work of Edward H. Boland. Yeah, that silver on there, those acorns that are around the side, the filigree, uh, silver, that meaning that you can see through it, it looks like filigree that the cattle eat. Isn't that right, yeah. Bill? Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it is, um, there's so many, and you can't really see on the fender uh, above the stirrup, there's there's a horse on there, and uh, but between the leather work that Bolin himself did, and he did the leather work, uh, he had people who did a lot of the silver work with him, but this is truly, uh, Truly an amazing piece. Yeah, this is a saddle I talked about a little earlier. And now you can see that Cheyenne roll on the back of the saddle. This is made in 1954 by Dick May Saddle, and he had a saddle shop over on, on Anna Pamu, right next to Woolworths there in 1950. And he made the saddles for old Spanish Shades PS. So you can see the logo on the fender there, and the fender that part coming down that the stirrup hangs onto. And then on the back, it says 1954. And uh, this saddle, again, was won by J.J. Hollister, and he donated to the museum a few years ago. 
this is another saddle that that we were talking that Bill mentioned earlier about the silversmiths and and field, uh, you know, here in Santa Barbara, dating back to what they started in the 1800s, 1821 or 1831 that the, the grandfather did, and then John Field and then Ed Field, who, and then the son, one of the great grandson is now making silver too, but they, they had a specific way of making that silver bill. Huh? Yeah, they, they didn't do any uh, engraving, they stamped all their silver. So they would create these, uh, John Field and his uh, offspring all, continued the work using John Field's original tools. And it gave it a tremendously unique and very identifiable style. And uh, uh, Gary Field, who is a uh, grandson, is continuing to work today and makes bits in the silver work as well in the same style, the same familial style that his, uh, is his legacy. Yeah, it's very distinct. I mean, you see a saddle with field silver on it and, you know, and they pop up in uh, the places where you wouldn't think they would sometimes. But this this saddle made in 1888 by J.M. Forbes, he was a Santa Barbara saddle maker, you know, at the same time that, that Loomis was around and some of the other saddle makers. And uh, this belongs to the, uh, uh, the Ventura County Museum and they had it in their basement and um, Anna down there as a curator there. And for years I was talking to her about it and and Charlie, we know Charlie, they did that uh, that Silversmith book that we kind of want to get into some time. But uh, anyway, and one, you know, after about three years, I kept calling her. And one day she called me up. She said, well, we can loan that saddle to you now. <laughs> I said, I'll be down there right now. <laughs> but I mean, this is fantastic. I mean, you're looking, 1888, the saddle was made. And you could ride this saddle today. Sure. Here's the favorite son of Santa Barbara, Ed Boreen. Um, and he had uh, this saddle, which is sort of a quasi mochia, which means it's a it's a there's a saddle tree, and then you kind of put an envelope of leather over it, as well as a rather dramatic horn work that's been laid on it. Uh, kind of a charro saddle, yeah. and he's leaning against a saddle that has. Saddlebags on the back, you see that long hair, and that was those were saddlebags that were covered that were effectively grizzly bear, uh, which was a is a whole other story of the, of the vaquero. But these grizzly bear bags were really much more for show and for indicating that they were uh, fairly tough hombres. I think is a fair way to put it. Yeah, this is a gift of the museum uh, from Silsby Spalding also, and he was a good friend of, uh, of, of um, Ed Boreen and Jody Young and, uh, you know, the rest of the people that were involved in the horse business. And uh, this actually is on loan to the Santa Barbara Historical Museum from the Carriage Museum. We have one thing on loan over there. But if you, if, I, you have not, if you have not been a recent visitor to the Historical Museum, that we have a gallery there that is dedicated to Ed Boreen. And as a bonus to top that off, later this year, early 2021, the museum will be publishing uh, a very important book on Edward Boreen that is being written by Byron Price, who is uh, probably one of the most important historians of the American West working today. And this will be a, a major publication by the museum. And believe me, you'll hear about it uh, because our, our glorious uh, uh, Deputy Executive Director, uh, Adesha Harwood, will be inundating you with information about it. But when we can all get together again safely and get in a room where we can look at wonderful paintings and talk about uh, the work of Ed Boreen, um, this will be available and uh, it's it's uh, but when you do have the opportunity when the museum is it available to be viewed if you have not gone through the boring gallery it changes every 90 days and we have two resident experts uh, uh, Warren and Marlena Miller who curate that and uh, they do a tremendous job scrounging artwork from all over the country 
So it's always fresh and new. But this is classic Boreen. This is like the green room for the Fiesta Parade. But uh, that's Dwight Murphy in the center. And I can't tell you who the other guys are. Yeah, I don't know. I don't recognize any of those tapaderos on any of those saddles or any of those saddles that they're, they're rocking. But they're kind of rocking those suits, you know. Although we've got, I think that's an Alamore knot on the far on the far left. That gentleman, I think he's got an Alamore knot tied uh, with his macate. But the other gentlemen have lovely martingales, and they're ready for the parade. Yeah, it almost looks like Selby Spalding. I've seen him wear a hat like that, and he had that little mustache, but I don't think he'd be on that horse or riding that saddle. He'd be on some little fancier, maybe the Vice oh, yeah. Supreme or one of the Sunburst saddles and with a with a breast collar is much nicer than that. And do we know where this is? Mason, do you have any idea where this is? Um, I mean, it, to me, it looks like the old Paseo Courtyard, kind of, but I, I'm not sure where that's yeah, at. Yeah, I don't know. Be interesting if any of our viewers have any idea where this is. Yeah, this we is on time. Are we okay? Oh my! We yeah, we'll we'll, uh, we'll 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 brush through these last couple of slides here. And uh, I told the chat that if anyone has questions, we'll save them for the end, so that way we okay. could do this and answer everyone's. Questions. Yeah, this is a nice picture of the gallery again. You know, from the show itself and. Uh, kind of a breakdown of some of the famous saddle makers. We had Jetlica and Sherman Loomis there, and then uh, Dick May and Visalia. Um, yeah, that, that was, and I think the Historical Museum saved all these uh, these parts. Yeah. And they're in storage, so we can drag those out again because they, they went to some great expense to, to put this show together. I, I got to tell you. Well, I got the thing that, the thing, one of the things that came out of this show that was the most popular, and you can see in all three of the pictures, you can see kind of a red glow inside the plexiglass. <laughs> yeah. Too. And this was a, a, this was all, all of these forms are made out of rebar. And our uh, exhibit designers who are tremendously talented, and they came up with this uh, campfire, which is effectively a fan with a red light and a scarf, but it flickered. And I can't tell you how many people have asked how the hell we did that, but it was really, uh, it really gave a tremendous centerpiece to the exhibit. Uh, this is great. This is, we were talking earlier about California bit makers and Marduenio is probably one of the more famous ones, at least one of the, the more collectible. There's quite a few of the other ones, you know, guitars and, you know, some of the other ones there. And, that is my phone ringing. That's great. Uh, I've gone ahead and muted Tom if you want to talk about it for a bit, Bill. Well, the, as you can see, these are what are called uh, Santa Inez rings. And Tom can talk to you a little bit about the maker. Yeah. But, go ahead, Tom. We were talking about the rings. He's muted, Mason. Tom, go to the bottom left there. You should see the mute button and you can unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. There. So, you know, getting back to Marduenio, you know, uh, it, this bit here is so, I mean, so important to Marduenio's collection because this was a bit that was found in 1923 at Tahiguas Ranch. That's where the landfill is today. And it was a working cattle ranch at one time. Um, and it was found there and uh, it was donated to the Historical Museum in 1965, and it was in your collection, and it was pretty beat up. Uh, you know, it was kind of wired together, and but it, it was Marduenio for sure. Well, uh, Bruce Hainer, who is a bit and spur maker and, you know, helpful to the museum quite a bit, you know, on different things, but he was able to make this bit look like it did back when it was made in probably about 1889. Uh, but I mean, it's fantastic. We put some Leva reins on it. Leva was a, a blind Indian woman that, that braided rawhide reins and they're fabulous today. They're extremely collectible. Uh, and then a, just a, a classic um, Visalia round head stall uh, with a Visalia concho on it. But this is just, I mean, 
you got to come down to the museum and see this when we open up again. We have a good collection of Arduino bits, but this one here in particular is really, really special. These labor, the labor reins, these what are called Santa Inez reins. Yes. Are, are what are called multi-strand reins. And this goes to the heart of the Vaquero culture of trying to show how light your horse was when you handled it. In other words, you're not reefing on the horse's neck, you're not pulling on his neck. Because as you can see in the photograph, uh, from the braided area, from the bottom, right in the middle, you can see the, it suddenly breaks into, I think it's a two, two or three strand, Tom, I can't remember. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's four. Okay, yeah. it's four strand, yeah. which was the ultimate thing. Because these things would, will break if you really pull on them. So it was a visual symbol as much as a training device that said when people rode in and they had these, quote, Santa Inez reins on their horse, this horse was broke. He was gentle. I don't have to pull on him. And so it's a, it's, it's a real testament to the horsemanship of these, of the Vaqueros of the era. And these and the labor. I don't know how many pairs of labor, labor reins are around. Do you know, Tom? No, not. I know there's 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 a few collectors in town that have sets of them. We have probably six, um, and they all came out of the Silsby Spalding collection because yep. he has he has some connection there because there's some a lot of Mordoño bits in there and and um, quite a few sets of these labor reins. But they're pretty special. Yeah. But it's something that's still being made today. I mean, this picture is a good example um, from the standpoint of if you want to learn about historic bits, historic bridles, historic braiders, you really have to take the time to go down to the Carriage Museum, sit down with Tom and chat about it because he really, he really does know and has so much information. And, you know, this stuff is going to go away. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like talking about collectible steering wheels. You know, it, yeah. <laughs> this was in an era where these things really mattered. And it mattered because when people saw them, they knew what kind of a horseman you were. And there was no brag, it was simply fact. And so when you go down and you look at the, the, the bridles and the rain sets that Tom has on display, we have some at, at the at the historical museum, but he, the, the focus there is really is really dramatic. And as I say, the, our partnership is is uh, it works really well because we go back and forth with these things. But um, the 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 bridles we had there at the show were frankly rather breathtaking. Yeah, and you look at them, I mean, they, they all got used. I mean, you know, look at the saddles and the yeah. quality of some of those saddles. But these guys, understand, these guys, they rode their horses for a living. And they had to buy the best equipment they could possibly afford because they had to use it every day. That was one of the things about this show that was so popular was the fact that people could go up and touch these saddles. The fact you rub on them is not going to hurt them. In fact, it's going to help them. You know, you're... Whatever oil you have on your hand is going to help help those saddles. But to be able to rub your hand along those uh, those saddles and 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 really see what that was like, in many cases over a hundred years ago, is pretty amazing. Yeah, those three saddles on the wall there were kind of significant in that the the one closest to you there was made by Visalia that looks like a Luma saddle. Right. And then there's a Luma saddle in the middle, and then a Forbes saddle down at the end. And those were all three made about the same time, 1880s, right around then. But um, I, I don't know that Visalia was 1880. That, that, was, no. that was later than that, more yeah. 1900s, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is a nice saddle with Ronald Reagan saddle. It said Ronald Reagan on the fender there, so we're pretty sure it was his. Um, <laughs> it's a basket stamp saddle and, and made by Capriola in 1980. Uh, Capriola was, uh, you know, in Elko, Nevada there, but interesting story about how the guy that John Barletta got the saddle from Reagan is that, and Barletta told me this story, he passed away a few years ago, but he was a Secret Service agent and, and rode with Reagan. He wrote a book called Riding with Reagan, but 
the story that he told me was uh, he had a big, uh, uh, you know, this big thoroughbred horse that had high withers and he needed to get a saddle and Ronald Reagan told him, well, try this out. So he tried it and it worked good. And so he told Reagan, he said, well, I got to get me one of these saddles. He said, what do you mean you got to get one of these? He says, you got one right there. And he gave him the saddle. So it's kind of a cool deal. It belongs to the, the, um, oh, the, the Reagan Center downtown now. John Barletta left it to them instead of me. But <laughs> I don't know what I can do about that. So I, 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 I cleaned it. I spent seven hours cleaning that. I got it out of his house and it was dirty. But anyway, <laughs> maybe I can borrow it from him. Here's another part of the exhibit. The shafts that you see there are working shafts. The, the one on the right. Uh, with all the little the drawing on it and the brands and the RV. Uh, those are illustrations done by Jody Young, another Santa Barbara artist. Uh, but it showed that these were leggings that, that people wore to ride and go through the brush. Yeah, I think another thing about Jody Young that, you know, we've talked about that, even the Western artists, and, and Bill wrote a great book about Jody Young. We had talked about it, even the protege of Charles Russell and live with him for about 10 or 11 years. But uh, Bill telling me one time that there's 400 books written about Charles Russell and one about Jody Young. <laughs> but down at the museum, you know, again, tooting the horn of the museum, when you come down there after this, this deal is over with here, is that we have a diorama that was made in 1932 by Jody Young. And it's one of a kind. There's six horses, a stagecoach. Jody Young spent 1,500 hours making the stagecoach for Sylvie Spalding. And it was at the Tech Woody Ranch until 1959 when Deborah Spalding sold the ranch. And then they took it to Hope Ranch and it sat there until 2011 when we got it. So now we have it on display. And this is the only time that this thing has been for public view. I mean, this yeah. is a fantastic piece of work. And Bill knows a lot about Jody Young. You might want to talk about him building the stagecoach and how. how well, we it was, you know, the one thing about Joe, he was not going to pass up a a deal where money was going to be paid because money was hard to find. And uh, the, the, in the book, we talk about what he was paid for it. But the, the most important thing was that no matter what he did, because of the amount of time he spent with Charles Russell, everything had to be authentic. And he would, it was his hill to die on to make sure that everything he did was authentic and appropriate and unquestionable to that. And uh, until the day he died, that was how he approached life, was to be not only an authentic person, but to be true to the, the West that Charlie Russell had depicted and did not want to see go away. Now there is the one and only Tom Peterson. That's me giving a tour. I just, what I love to do, I'm in my element right there. <laughs> that was a picture that we showed earlier there, those four saddles there. And I guess I'm pointing, there's a picture of the Tecolote Tack Room of a couple of ladies. We never figured out who they were, but we're sure that's the Tecolote Tack Room. Ed Borain painted a, what they call the, the freeze, and it's the story of the cowboys and Indians and uh, moving west with the cattle drive. And it's 104 feet long, and it's painted with India ink on airplane spruce, and it's in the Carriage Museum today. Oh, here's the boy. So this is Wilford Brimley on the left and Tom Peterson and Griff Durham. I'm kidding about Wilford Brimley. We are sorry that he has passed on. But, uh, yeah, Griff's been a great help to the museum, you know, with all his knowledge about these saddles and everything that, you know, he's pretty free with the information, I got to tell you. He's given us quite a, quite a bit of information and, and stuff that we have in the museum as far as uh, Visalia catalogs and things like that. So, and, and contributed to a newsletter like Bill has. This was probably, a, you could, I think you can all tell, this was sort of a postman's holiday for Tom and I to do this show, simply because it was just, it was so incredibly wonderful to get all these saddles in a room together and these incredible graphics that the museum put together from uh, not only the library, images that we have, but from uh, uh, donated pieces. And, you know, there's talk about doing this again because it was so well attended, but I'll tell you, we certainly have, um, we certainly have enjoyed doing this today. And I would be remiss as president of the board if I did not suddenly come in and, and make a pitch uh, 
in order for us to do these kinds of events, uh, certainly during the cocktail hour and other times, uh, it takes a lot of work from our staff. They're working after hours. And, you know, our attempt today is to make the museum as relevant to your lives here in Santa Barbara and the county as, as much as we can, make it enjoyable and a learning experience. Please don't be afraid to donate to the museum. Please don't be afraid to join. And when we open, we would be gloriously happy to welcome you with open arms to come back in and see the new things that we're doing. Yeah, Mason's a great help to, the, to, to all of us involved with the museum too, with a lot of the things that he does there, putting, helping us with these webinars that we're doing there. But actually on that saddle show, I saw him physically paint that green wall. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mason, Mason gets, he, he's up for five or six Congressional Medals of Honor, I think, coming up, but uh, it's either going to go to him or his cat, but <laughs> I don't think we could get any of this stuff done without all of our incredible staff there. Uh, Mason is, is, he puts up with all of the uh, naivete of Tom and I, and Daisha, our uh, Deputy Director, who is... Uh, Equal, equally as kind. So, uh, boy, we sure appreciate you all looking tonight and uh, hope you enjoyed it.